let's get started. Let me welcome you to what is the third philosophy pop-up. I do uh, two of these a month, uh, one on YouTube Live and one uh, on Facebook Live and very different uh, processes for both of those. Um, one off of my Facebook page, one off of my YouTube profile. And I'm kind of experimenting right now with seeing which format works better for, for what we're trying to do. So um, today, I thought since you know we're building up to October, which is a huge month for all things Stoic related because we have Stoic Week, Stoic Con, there are Stoic Con Xs, and also we had some really cool uh, news, if you haven't looked at Stoicism today, yet today, uh, modern Stoicism has finally entered into a new phase of, of its development as an organization. So um, I thought that this month what I would do is, is talk about um, Stoicism. Uh, since since it's something that I'm I'm kind of you know in the mix with, and I wanted to focus specifically on the issue of what does in accordance with nature mean because that trips up a, a lot of people. So I'll talk a little bit about that at the beginning, but um, anything is fair game. We can talk about anything stoicism related. We can talk about uh, anything in terms of other ph philosophical stuff. I can see all of your your uh, comments and. Um, uh, you know, sign-ins, uh, people are saying, uh, you know, I'm from here, I'm from there, and uh, questions, I'll, and I'll, I'll answer them as time goes on. Um, so let me start out by, by talking first a little bit about, you know, I mentioned modern Stoicism, um, and actually I'll also answer a question sort of before it gets so buried in the stream, uh, somebody write a uh, Kad Mon Zohar too is neo stoicism a word? It is indeed a word, and it's an old fashioned word. Um, when we use the term neo stoicism, that actually refers to historical phenomena within uh, from the the Renaissance on through the early modern period. Uh, there were people who called themselves neo-Stoics. And so for people who are doing, you know, modern adaptations of Stoicism in the contemporary world, we tend to use the term uh, modern Stoics rather than neo-Stoics. Um, so it's not the same thing as like neo-Aristotelians, where neo-Aristotelians mean contemporary uh, Aristotelians in, in many respects. Um, and there is actually a division within the, the current Stoic large community uh, between people who view themselves as more traditional Stoics, sometimes they call themselves Orthodox Stoics, and then people who um, are, you know, from a wide range of, of viewpoints, adapting it in certain ways and leaving some things out. And that will have something to do with, with some of the topic that we're talking about here. Some proponents of modern Stoicism think that um, we can dispense with this whole, you know, living in accordance with nature bit. So let me talk about, about that first. Um, one of the key ideas early on in the development of Stoicism is this living in accordance with nature or being in accordance with nature. And nature in, in Greek is phusis. Um, and that it doesn't mean exactly the same thing as what we tend to think of when, when you know, people are talking about the natural sciences. It, it, it encompasses that, but it, 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 in a certain way, it goes beyond that. So, um, you know, the natural philosopher uh, would, would also be studying, say, psychology, as we see Aristotle doing in his, his Nicomachean ethics or things like that. Um, the Stoics talked about living in accordance with nature, and early on, I imagine we don't actually have any records of this, but people were, you know, asking, you know, what the hell do you mean by that? You know, so this is something that they actually clarified. And if you want to see um, some of the texts where where we have some some summaries of this, you want to look in a few different sources. One is Diogenes Laertes, Lives of the Philosophers, Book Seven, which is about the Stoics, and it talks about Zeno and and what he did and their doctrines, and then it talks about their successors. Um, you also want to check out Cicero, uh, specifically, I would say, if you only could pick a few books, his On Duties. Uh, the um, on the ends and then the Tusculan disputations because there's a lot of discussions about stoicism and nature 
in that. And then we're going to see it pop up in, in various places in the, the Stoics who we still actually have texts of, like uh, Musonius Rufus is going to talk about it. Seneca will reference it. Uh, Epictetus will reference it, and he'll do a kind of interesting twist that I'll talk about. And then Marcus Aurelius, and even uh, you know later authors will reference it. I, I actually checked out yesterday uh, so I could reread it. Arius Didymus's Epitome of Stoic Ethics. There's a lot of discussion of what uh, being in accordance with nature means for that. So um, one thing that I think is really helpful from the beginning is to sort of put on hold or, or bracket um, modern conceptions of what nature is. Because if we want to understand what these, you know, uh, uh, you know third uh, century uh, on thinkers are, are talking about, we want to understand, we want to understand it in terms of what, what their texts actually say. And we don't want to read in a lot of other stuff. This is where, where a lot of criticisms of the Stoics tend to be off base because the Stoics may mean something different by nature than what um, somebody else does. For example, in that famous Nietzsche passage that so many people love to post on the modern Stoicism group as if they're you know, announcing something new, Nietzsche has a very, very different conception of nature than the Stoics did. And so he's criticizing them for not essentially not sharing the same viewpoint on it as he has. Um, the Stoics distinguished between nature understood as the totality of everything that is. So being in accordance with nature involves our relation to the universe, which we can understand in, in part uh, through uh, the sciences, right? That's very helpful for that. Um, but it also has to do with the kind, the nature of the kind of beings that we are, a distinctively human nature. And for the Stoics, I, I'm actually going to concentrate on that part first, and then I'll come back to uh, the, the other part. And then, um, you know, maybe start taking some of the, the questions that I see piling up. Um, Cicero is a great example of this. So Cicero, in you're going to see this in On Duties and On the Ends, um, when he's having a, you know, he's presenting the Stoic position, and Cicero, by, by the way, is not himself a hardcore Stoic. He's an eclectic. He, he uh, likes some elements of their ideas, and he, he actually identifies more closely with the academic skeptic school, uh, although he's not totally on, on track with them either. Um, Cicero will talk about how the Stoics thought that um, all living beings attempt to continue their being. And they do what conduces to, to their life. Um, human beings are like that as well. We have these drives for self-preservation, for doing things that, that are going to conduce to, to, to our, our life. But we also uh, are rational. And rationality is not just a matter of, say, possessing logic or being able to uh, do science or, or things like that. It's much more basic. It has to do with our capacity to, to think uh, in a variety of flexible ways in many situations. And the Stoics thought that rationality, the more that we develop it, the more that we're actually, because it's not something we can take for granted. It doesn't just automatically develop the way, you know, uh, with proper cultivation, uh, the, the, the seed turns into a corn plant and then produces more corn or something like that. Um, it requires education. It requires cultivation. Uh, there's a lot of ways in which rationality can be damaged or, or go astray. But when it is properly developed, we um, realize that our good isn't just our good, that it lies in how we're related to other people. And we understand ourselves as social creatures, as part of a larger whole that could be very small, like a family and you know, our immediate relationships, or it could be much larger, uh, like humanity as such. So the Stoics you know, are ultimately going to be these cosmopolitans who, who think that you know, everybody in, in some sense matters, um, even if everybody is screwed up. Um, as the Stoics think most people, in fact, are, including themselves on the way to becoming less screwed up, right? Um, so we have this, this common human nature. And um, to live in accordance with nature, then, 
means not just to do whatever you feel like doing or what feels natural because maybe your maybe your human nature is kind of screwed up maybe you've got bad habits maybe culture has been teaching you the wrong sorts of things and you've drawn the wrong sorts of lessons it's actually to to get closer and closer to this ideal of the virtuous person the person who actually has and has fully developed these virtues of um Cicero talks about this as well. Part of what it means to be a rational being is we want to understand things. We want to make sense of things. Um, we also have to live together in, in you know, relationships and in, in society. And that's where justice comes in. And justice for the Stoics doesn't just mean a strict kind of legalistic justice. It extends even to what we nowadays would call benevolence. Um, treating other people well, or kindness, or generosity. And again, if you want to see discussions of this, read Cicero's On Duties. It's right there in book one. Um, a wonderful text. I'm actually teaching it in my uh, uh, two ethics sections from Marquette this semester, uh, and I'm hoping the students will enjoy it as much as, as I know I do. Um, one of the virtues. And courage isn't just, you know, being a tough guy or uh, resisting fear. It's resisting fear for the right reason at the right time, um, standing up for what's right. And then, of course, temperance, the moderation of our, our appetites for, for things, um, self-control in, in a way. These are the things that comprise a fully developed human nature. And so living in accordance with nature doesn't mean just, you know, following our, our, you might say, baser instincts or doing what it is that the evolutionary biologists tell us we're all about, you know. Uh, the Stoics would say that's a um, degenerate or, or um, selective understanding of human nature. This other part is possible for us as well. Now, you know, who do we point to as examples of this? Um, you know, there, there are some examples, uh, and, and it's interesting. This is a bit of a digression, um, and I won't do too many of these because I don't want to take up too much time with digressions. But um, so, you know, there's this big question of, well, who is the virtuous person? Who has virtue developed to the highest extent? Cicero, if you read his works uh, discussing these sorts of issues, particularly about virtue, he says, you know, um, we, we can set the bar very high, but if, if we want it to be more practical for us, we got to look at people who have some of the virtues, but maybe not all of them, or they've developed them to a certain extent, but not, not fully. And here he differs from the Stoics, because some of the Stoics saw virtue as kind of like an off-on switch some of the time, right? Either you got it, or you don't. Um, and some went so far as to say, look, either you're virtuous or you're vicious, which means uh, most of us are, are vicious, right? Cicero said, no, 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 we can look at some great examples. And he'd cite examples from Roman history, um, which we can't relate to that easily unless we, we know the history. But he, he also brought up a lot of other uh, sort of, you know, examples that we, we could relate to because we can see the principles behind it. This person behaved this way. Um, and so that is part of what it means to live in accordance with nature. Now, there's, there's entailments to that, which would include, um, you know, cultivating our persons, right? Doing the sort of instrumental things we need to do in order to be able to live in accordance with nature. So there's some things that by themselves aren't in accordance with nature or out of accordance with nature, but our use of them can, can make them so. Think about wealth, for example. You know, uh, the Stoics don't say that you shouldn't have any wealth. They're not cynics who who sort of rejected uh, all external goods, um, at least you know from what we can tell, as being valueless compared to virtue. Uh, the Stoics said, you know, uh, sometimes wealth can be used to to you know promote good ends um, it's not it's not automatically going to do that but you can use wealth in accordance with nature you can raise your children in a way that's in accordance with nature which means you can also do it in a way that's that's out of accordance with nature um, now going back to the sort of like let's call it capital n nature not just human nature but but um you know the whole universe um, the stoics also think that we ought to try to uh, you know, adapt ourselves as best as we can to the way things go. So there's, there's certain things that are not possible 
for us human beings, at least at this point, given the current level of technology. And, um, you know, those are the sort of things that we just have to sort of live with and, and accept and not get all worked up about uh, because that's going to then affect our living in accordance with nature in terms of our own human nature. Um, and so you'll see a lot of discussion about, you know, um, being okay with, with the circumstances, understanding things that are physical processes as physical processes. The wind is not out there blowing in your face because it wants to, you know, screw you over or, or tick you off or something like that. Uh, I mean, people do have a lot of, you know, sort of crazy notions about these, these sorts of things. And so, you know, um, studying uh, human nature and, and the nature of the universe can be very useful. The Stoics did have some some views on that. Um, this is what we what we would call the Stoic physics, right? And I mentioned the distinction between traditional Stoics and and modern Stoics. Um, modern Stoics tend to, um, you know, be very adaptable when it comes to accepting things from the traditional Stoic physics. Uh, for example, the notion that the universe itself is a rational being uh, and, and cares about us, um, many of the modern Stoics reject that, that point of view, right? Traditional Stoics would say that that's an intrinsic part of it. Um, the one other thing I do want to mention before I start looking at all these, these uh, questions that I see uh, coming up in the live chat, um, Epictetus, I mentioned that he does something a little bit different. So if you read Epictetus much, you're going to see him uh, referring to something that we translate typically as moral purpose in English or as um, faculty of choice, or some, some people will translate it as will or volition. And this in Greek is proiresis. Um, it's a term that, that Epictetus gives a particularly heavy weight to. Um, the only other person in the ancient period who gives it a similarly important place in their moral theory is actually Aristotle. But it's not precisely the same thing for Epictetus as it is for Aristotle. It's more limited for Aristotle. For Epictetus, the faculty of choice is, um, it, it, it's sort of in the ruling faculty, the way in which we, we actually do decide things. And it's not something radically different from the rational faculty. This is an interesting, uh, you know, part of, of Stoic uh, psychology, you might call it. Now, what's the import for this? Epictetus is not just going to talk about living in accordance with nature or about living, in a, you know, living a virtuous life or something like that. He's going to talk about um, having or maintaining our proiresis, our faculty of choice in accordance with nature. So this is a, a bit of a, a wrinkle, because um, you can say, well, what does that actually mean? And then, you know, they, they give lots and lots of examples. So uh, I'll, I'll just give you one example. Um, your family members are kind of jerks, and um, they, they, you know, say mean things to you, even though you're, you're trying to be good to them. Um, you have a choice. You can keep your faculty of choice in accordance with nature, which would mean to treat them as human beings. It doesn't necessarily mean to take any sort of abuse they're going to dish out. There, there's points at which justice would, would you know, say, no, I, I shouldn't put up with that sort of thing. Um, but you can avoid getting angry at them. Every, every time that you get angry, uh, not only Epictetus, but, but also Cicero say uh, you're, you're out of accord with nature. Um, even though we might say, oh, that's just human nature. No, that's, that's, that's a kind of damaged human nature. That's not a realized human nature. And so we have the capacity to choose about the ways in which we choose to reform our habits, to even identify our habits and to think about this sort of stuff. Um, that's what Epictetus is calling our attention to. All right, so now uh, I see there's a ton of uh, questions. So I'm going to scroll up. And get past the hello everybody. I'm from here. I'm from there. Stuff. Um, so here's a here's a good uh, question uh, coming from Silver Silver Shadow X. I am skeptical of philosophy as a form of therapy. Since you do philosophical counseling, what has been your experience? How did you get started? Um, well, so um, I got started. I would say in researching anger because I. Um, that's something I've struggled with pretty much my whole life, um, and I've gotten somewhat better with it. 
And a good bit of the getting better took place through seeing what ancient philosophers um, had to say about it, which, which often is so good that it can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with uh, contemporary psych psychological stuff. Um, it was a really pressing problem for them. And then I started, you know, looking into other things. And, and so I've been very interested in human motivation and how we work upon ourselves in, in what a lot of people these days like to call philosophy as a way of life. I'm, I'm not so, so uh, you know, enthused about, about that title because I think that if we look at actual, you know, philosophical stuff, that's not a new idea that, that you know, uh, Pierre Ado somehow just popped into the middle of the 20th century. It's lots of 20th century philosophers treated philosophy as a, a, a way of life. Um, but I, I found that it was, it was helpful for me. Um, and I saw that there were resources in a lot of uh, great thinkers that, that could be adapted and that what was going on quite often in the better psychotherapeutic theories um, was often replicating. Uh, what was what was going on, or it could be improved by bringing it into into there. And then, you know, it, it's not just about dealing with, say, emotional issues or stuff like that. Some of the psychological counseling I do is with uh, startup CEOs who are trying to, you know, do, get better at, 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 you know, practical reasoning, thinking out, you know, relations between means and ends, how to prioritize, all, all of that sort of stuff. Um, it's, uh, you know, should you be skeptical of philosophy as a form of therapy? You should be skeptical of a couple things. One is somebody just putting a book in your hand, whether it's a book of philosophy or a self-help book or a, you know, one of these uh, uh, psychotherapeutic workbooks or something like that and saying, go to it, um, because that's probably not going to be all that helpful. You generally, you need somebody else, you know, to, to, to talk with and to work your way through things with. Um, and I think there's, there's people out there who um, are not particularly well suited to, to doing that, that, that try their hand at it. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, you, know, you got to kind of figure out who, who's good and who's not. But my, my experience has been that um, resources from classical and even some, you know, uh, later, you know, medieval and, and early modern and, and contemporary philosophy can be incredibly useful. And I, I do, one of my big consulting projects is actually working with a, uh, uh, a center, a psychotherapy center in helping them turn uh, philosophical, con philosophical concepts into to psychotherapeutic constructs. So, so I see there's, there's a lot of, of use to it. Stoicism turns out to be particularly uh, helpful for that. Um, here's another really good question. Uh, Gumnam uh, 1000, I'm recently going through a religious turmoil. Can Stoicism fill up the gap of religious belief or devotion? Um, so it, it really depends. Uh, you know, um, it depends on what your religious belief or devotion was like. Um, I, you know, it, it's not just Stoicism, but all sorts of things can come to be kind of a substitute for for uh, a belief system that one felt very strongly about that had some practical implications. That's why we sometimes see people jump from system to system. Um, I don't know that I would actually pick up stoicism to be a substitute in that way myself. Although I think there are some people who do that, um, you know, and they sort of go whole heart, hog wild into it. They become very enthusiastic. Um, but then I, I don't know that all that many of them actually stick with it. Stoicism is, is um, really about, you know, developing self-awareness, um, understanding your relationship with the world and others, understanding your own, your own background and why you do the things that you do and making decisions about what you want to change uh, and what you want to, uh, what good things you have that you want to sort of reinforce. Um, there aren't religious rituals or, or things like that uh, in, in most people's interpretations of Stoicism. Um, and there are actually Christian um, Stoics who don't accept, you know, say, for example, all of the Stoic physics, but uh, do in fact, you know, connect up um, Stoicism with, with uh, uh, their Christian practice. Uh, I know some secular Buddhists who, who, who connect it up as, as well. So, um, all right, so 
here's another question. Astro 333, wouldn't the philosophies of Nietzsche and Sartre and Camus be a form of modern Stoicism? They take a lot of ideas from them. Well, so taking ideas from somebody doesn't mean that you're actually uh, in that tradition. Um, Nietzsche is very critical about the Stoics, quite honestly. Um, and, and I mentioned that that one uh, uh, passage that, that everybody likes to quote you know, every so often. Just, just go onto the Modern Stoicism uh, Facebook group, and about once a week, somebody will put that up there and say, hey, Nietzsche said this. Doesn't that mean all the Stoics are wrong? You know? um, Nietzsche and Sartre and Camus and, and many other uh, 19th, 20th century philosophers, you know, they, they read about Stoicism, and they talk about many similar themes. But, um, I mean, Sartre, right off the bat, you know, Stoicism thinks that there is a human nature. Sartre says, nope, that's that's not the case. So Stoicism would be sort of like those those other philosophies that are saying there is a human essence, um, and he's rejecting that. Um, you know, Camus believes that the universe fundamentally is absurd, and he's trying to figure out how do we how do we deal with that. Stoics don't believe the universe is absurd. Um, so there's there's you know there's interesting. Uh, connections. There are some similar themes. There may even be some similar uh, bits of advice. Um, I don't see anything in, say, Nietzsche or Sartre Camus like what goes on with Stoic practice. Um, but there, there might be some people out there who've adapted Nietzsche or Sartre Camus in, in that way. Um, Ennis Az, Azfour says, can you tell us about Marcus Aurelius? Yeah, I'll keep that one very brief. Um, he's, you know, he's a Roman emperor, one of the good ones. There weren't many. And he was a uh, Stoic. Um, he he uh, studied philosophy. Um, he was uh, uh, stuck in what we would call, a, a, you know, a management position for a very long time, uh, mo you know, a good portion of, of the second half of his life. Um, and he tried to, you know, apply his, his Stoicism to the problems of being an emperor. Um, and then he wrote down these thoughts that he has. He's very influenced by Epictetus um, and uh, brings him up quite a bit. And that, that's, you know, the, the, the key thing is his meditations. There's also a nice correspondence with, with uh, Fronto that we learn a bit from. By the way, I should put in a, a pitch here. So Donald Robertson has been doing a lot of stuff recently on Marcus Aurelius. Um, and uh, you'll see him posting quite frequently uh, some really interesting bits of information in the uh, Stoicism group on Placebook. Here's a really interesting question. Um, um, by Christy Hanganu, how come Plato's and Aristotle's works have been kept, but the Stoics or Epicureans who came after have so few works remaining? Um, well, um, that's a good question. You know, when it comes down to it, we do, in fact, have a lot of Plato's works. Um, we don't have a lot of what Aristotle wrote. Um, if we look at Diogenes Laertes' um, catalog of Aristotle's works, we're missing a lot of them. And... One of the things that we're missing that I would particularly have loved to, to have access to, Aristotle, we, we have one book by Aristotle called the Athenian Constitution. And by constitution, he doesn't mean something like a written document, uh, you know, like we have with our, our constitution here in the United States. He means sort of a, a history of the political development and the, you know, um, social mores and, and all of that involved in a particular political community. So Aristotle and his students did over a hundred of these of different Greek states and societies. And we, we only have one of them, the Athenian one. Um, now, um, the Stoics, we, we do have a good bit of stuff. It's mostly the later stuff. Um, we can reconstruct a good portion of what the Stoics were about uh, through Cicero and um, even, even people who sometimes disagree with them like Plutarch and Galen. Um, the Epicureans, Epicurus was one of the most prolific writers in antiquity, and we have almost nothing from him. 
Uh, what we do have is preserved, thankfully, because Diogenes Laertes was, was nice enough to write it all out and stick it into his uh, uh, Lives of the Philosophers because he was really impressed by Epicurus. Um, with the Epicureans, I mean, we do also have an Epicurean literature later on, you know, like Lucretius and people like that. With the Epicureans, um, they tended to be um, viewed by most of the other philosophical schools as you know, off base. And in religious contexts, Epicurean philosophy was often just sort of a synonym for uh, atheism. You know, you'll, you'll see the Epicureans referred to sometimes synonymously with atheists. So that might explain part of it. Um, the Stoics, you know, why did we lose Chrysippus? Why did we lose Zeno? Um, why don't we have uh, Posidonius and Penetius and all that? Um, we don't really know. Uh, and every once in a while, we're lucky enough to find some new scrolls or, or uh, you know, bits of things here and there. Um, for, for example, there's, there's actually a cool thing from, Ep, uh, from Epic, Epicurus called the Vatican sayings. That is because it was found in the uh, Vatican library, which uh, is not a, you know, super secret place. You know, there's all these funny conspiracy theories that go way back about, oh, they're hiding things. No, it's just very disorganized. And, uh, uh, in a lot of cases, you know, manuscripts may have, uh, you know, included a lot of different things and it takes scholars going in and digging around to, to find these, these, uh, these things. Um, I actually had a, a professor who, who was digging around in the Vatican library and, and found uh, in, in one manuscript uh, a portion of it that belonged to another guy and he recognized it and, you know, wrote an article about it. Um, so, you know, why, why don't we possess more? I, I, don't, I don't really know. I will say this, um, some of the stuff that we do have uh, was preserved by those medieval monks. Um, they, they liked Seneca, uh, interestingly enough. Um, and uh, they did preserve Epictetus, although they inserted a bunch of, you know, little, little Christianizing things here and there. So the text is not actually uh, cleaned up until, <laughs> until the Renaissance. So... All right. Uh, let me scroll down a little bit. Um, I see a lot of sort of short uh, things that are hard to figure out what they are as questions. Um, so if you do ask a question, you actually want to like, like follow, make it make it something like a full sentence, or else I can't figure out what it's saying. Um, here we go. Um, Oops, scrolling, uh, just lost where I was. Uh, here we go. Um, could I explain more about modern versus traditional Stoicism? This is Alonzo Cervantes. Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, modern Stoicism, um, we just actually did a, an interesting symposium on this in Stoicism Today, which is on the Modern Stoicism site, where we had um, seven or eight of the members, the, the steering committee members of, of the Modern Stoicism organization weigh in with what they think modern Stoicism is, and they don't all completely agree with each other. Um, John Sellers wrote another one, and I'm going to put that together with my, my own uh, reflections on it in another follow-up piece, uh, maybe maybe next week or the week after that. So modern Stoicism is kind of a wide spectrum, right? And I guess you could say if there's one thing that connects all of it together, it's, it's that it tries to take classical Stoicism and adapt it selectively uh, and interpretively to, to modern life. So <clears throat> the things in the Stoic physics that, that you know, we, we just don't really buy into, like the notion that the, the universe is going to, you know, disappear into a, a, a conflagration, the ekporosis, uh, and then start again. Um, I don't, you know, I don't think anybody really accepts that in the modern Stoic uh, thing. A lot of modern Stoics are, are actually uh, atheists, or they may be religious believers belonging to, you know, one of the major world religions. Um, 
in part because the, 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 the parts of Stoicism that, that are tied in with the traditional Stoic conception of religion, which if you want to see, read Cicero's On the Nature of the Gods, because it's, it's, it's uh, presented there. Um, they just don't buy that stuff, you know. They don't. They don't buy the pantheism or the the universe as <clears throat> one big sentient creature. Um, you know, I think the atheist ones because they say, well, that that's not that way, and the other ones because they say, well, that's you know, that's not uh, the way they can they they conceive of the God, right, as just being the universe. Um, traditional Stoicism takes the um, the Stoic physics, at least certain elements of it, particularly in terms of like providence and, and uh, you know, everything being ordered providentially, seriously. There's actually, uh, in traditional Stoicism, uh, you can become ordained as a Stoic philosopher, weddings and ceremonies and stuff like that, because, you know, we here in America, um, we, we, uh, we, you know, all you have to do is say that you're running some sort of religious organization and you can ordain people to do that. So um, there's a lot of debate, which I consider very healthy, about precisely what modern Stoicism is. I think personally that if it's not really grounded in some way in the texts, um, that we shouldn't really call it Stoicism. So I'm, I'm willing to set a kind of cutoff point and say that people who just happen to mention the dichotomy of control or put a picture of Marcus Aurelius or Epictetus in their blog post or video, they're not really doing Stoicism. Um, they're doing something that we might call Stoicism light or, um, you know, uh, uh, in some cases just exploiting it. Um, and, and there are a lot of people who, who take up Stoicism uh, and then try to make it serve some, some other purposes, um, you know, for example, the modern Stoics are cos or the, the the Stoics were cosmopolitans, and they were firm believers in justice. So, if if your interpretation of Stoicism is is this you know one that stresses sort of hyper masculinity and virtuous as masculinity, and um, you know that you got to be as tough as possible, um, that's not really Stoicism. That's that's something that. Um, you know, might might take the mantle of Stoicism, but it's not really Stoicism because there's major parts of Stoicism that wind up contradicting it. You know, you can't use Stoicism for, for example, ethno-nationalism um, because of the cosmopolitanism. Um, all you got to do is read Cicero, again, somebody who was very proud of Rome, but who recognized that there was a, uh, you know, wider, wider uh, range that we need to think about or read Epictetus. And you'll see that that's just not compatible. So, so there's, you know, there's traditional Stoicism, there's modern Stoicism, and then there's this whole penumbra of stuff that, that sometimes people call Stoicism that really, if, if we read the text and, and get to, to know them better, we say that, well, that's not really Stoicism. Um, I, I answered the question about Nietzsche, so I'm going to skip over the, the absurd stuff. Um, Let's see here. Oh, here's a great uh, question from Daniel um, Shevyakov, I think is how I should be pronouncing it. Does Stoicism have anything to say in particular about dealing with confrontation or being courageous? Yeah, actually it does quite a bit. Um, I would say that you're going to find some good discussions of that in... Uh, again, in Cicero's texts, like On Duties, there's an entire section devoted to courage. Um, interestingly, you'll also see some great discussion in Seneca's On Anger, uh, in part because um, anger, you know, a lot of people conceive of anger as something that's useful when we have to deal with confrontations. And Seneca, like most of the Stoics, makes the case that it really isn't uh, uh, that 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 reliable of an ally to draw on and that instead we should be relying upon reason practical reasoning and getting ourselves to do the right thing there are times when when we do have to stand up for ourselves epictetus also talks about this these these sorts of topics as well so um yeah dealing dealing with with confrontation one of the key things i would say is we don't want to go and confront people just for the sake of confronting them right C courage for the stoics uh, involves um, 
you know, resisting our, our fears and standing fast in, in the face of adversity for the right reasons, not just because we, we want to do it, right? Epictetus actually talks about, you know, people who like make up their mind about something and then they, they stand firm and um, it's the wrong thing. And he says, that's really dumb. That's not, that's not being virtuous at all. That's just being obstinate. So that, that's an important part. And then, you know, stoicism um, can help us deal with our, our fears. We can examine them. We can, you know, one of the things that happens when we feel afraid in confrontations is we, we um, worry about, you know, all these other things that are going to be spillover from it. And we, we present those uh, possibilities to us as if they're probabilities and we allow ourselves to feel more fear or anxiety about that. Um, so, you know, stoicism can, can help us with that. Um, let's see here. Oh, here's, here's a nice quote of Phil Atwood. The second is posting, the best years of your life are the ones in which you decide your problems are your own. You do not blame them on your mother, the ecology, or the president from Alfred Al uh, yeah, Alfred Ellis. Um, uh, yeah, that's, you know, that's in line with, with uh, uh, Stoicism. Uh, Epictetus says that the, the person who's been practicing Stoicism uh, moves from blaming others uh, first to blaming himself, and then after a while doesn't blame anybody. Um, Christopher Birch, how would Epictetus advise us on dealing with everyday frustrations and just plain coping with circumstances beyond our control. Um, well, he gives us all sorts of advice about that, not just in the Enchiridion, but in his much longer discourses, which um, uh, the, uh, the, the Enchiridion is just sort of a best hits li list of. Um, you know, one thing is, is here, here's one practical thing we can do. We can reframe the everyday frustrations that we're experiencing by um, thinking in terms of what's what what in them is in our control, what in them is not in our control, and whether it really makes sense for us to get uh, very upset about the things that aren't in, in our control. They're not going to go into our control because we get angry or afraid or ashamed or uh, desirous about them. Um, you know, they're, they're even less responsive than people. Like, you know, when we go and bother people because we're like, hey, I've got this problem. I need you to solve it for me. And they're like, you know, imagine you're, you're like at the DMV and you want people to make a special case for you, right? Um, uh, they don't want to make a special case for you at most DMVs. Uh, and, and at least with a person, you can reason with them. If you're worried about like, you know, your coffee tasting bad or something like that, you know, go get yourself another coffee or, or, uh, be okay with not drinking coffee or, uh, you know, there's all sorts of other possibilities. Um, let me take a look at this one. Uh, Almighty Om asks a sort of big open-ended question. Do you think this new modern malaise will create a new philosophical movement or school born of neo-nationalism, consumption, economy, political plutocracy, et cetera? So I'm, I'm imagining that those are part of the, the malaise, right? Uh, that's being discussed. Um, I mean, there's new philosophical movements and schools being created all the time. Um, it's kind of a, an ongoing process. That's why it's part of why it's so hard for any one person in the philosophy business just to stay on top of, um, you know, what's going on in the 21st century. Um, you can't read everybody. You can't follow everybody. There's, there's always a lot happening. Some of it is, I think, for the sake of creating something novel, um, but some of it is, is really trying to respond to new exigencies. Um, sure, so sure, I'm sure there'll be lots of new philosophical movements in schools. Um, the question is whether they're any good, <clears throat> whether they're, they're really going to help us, um, or whether we should you know, pay more attention to classical philosophy. Here's another interesting question um, from Loathe of Bread. That's a good pun there. Is Stoicism pragmatic in your opinion? So that's, that's interesting to ask me because where I did my philosophical formation, uh, Southern Illinois University Carbondale, 
is in fact one of the few places that has a philosophy graduate program where you can study classical American philosophy, including pragmatism, uh, with with you know top notch experts on it. Um, there's sort of a handful of, of places in America where you can do that. Um, ironically, American philosophy gets less taught than the Anglo-American import analytic philosophy uh, or the continental philosophy. Um, so when we talk about pragma pragmatic, we can talk about whether it's got connections with pragmatism uh, understood through, say, Peirce, James Dewey, people like that. Uh, or whether we're just being, you know, using it with a lowercase p being kind of broad in our, our understanding of that, like saying that it's practical. And the answer to that is yes, Stoicism is practical philosophy. Um, one big branch of it is ethics, and Stoic ethics is precisely about how to, you know, understand and transform your, your life because it's the one that you've got to work on. And that involves, you know, again, talking about this, understanding what is in accordance with nature, what's not in accordance with it, choosing the one instead of the other. Um, and we can, we can go on and on with that. Um, even the Stoic logic, which they made some interesting contributions to, is also pragmatic um, in the sense that, you know, it's, it's there to serve um, living well. Um, Epictetus, you'll see him talking about this. A great example in one of the discourses, he's got somebody who's who's in one of his classes, and you know what's one of the top questions that students always bring up? When is this ever going to be useful for me? And and so Epictetus taught logic as well as ethics, and he's like, yeah, if you don't want to study it, don't study it. Uh, see what happens. Now, when you get into a situation where you actually need to distinguish between a good, you know, argumentative appeal and a bad one, or a good uh, framework and a bad one, uh, of, of you know how we connect our thoughts together, you're kind of screwed because you didn't want to study the logic and you didn't want to practice it. But that's on you, buddy. Now, now do you want to come back to class and uh, we'll go over it again? And you know, Epictetus is very pragmatic that way, and he, he takes his cues from Socrates. Um, Socrates, he says, uh, went around and, you know, was, was telling people, you know, here's how I think you ought to prioritize things. The soul is more important than the body, you know, pay attention to the care of the self and all that. And, and Epictetus says, you know, only one person in a thousand actually listened to him. Um, and, uh, he kept on doing it. Um, and Epictetus is, you know, if somebody reads his works and uh, says, well, this is all bullshit, I'm not going to spend any time doing this, um, this is a waste of my time, that's not hurting Epictetus, he doesn't care, right? And he wouldn't have cared in his class, he's not going to let himself get worked up about that. Uh, and then if a student, you know, realizes later on that it could be useful for them and they come back to class, he says, okay, now we can get down to work and start, start uh, studying. Um, Okay, so I, I will answer DL's question. There's a little bit of uh, back and forth in the chat thing about that. What do I think about Stephen Hawking saying that philosophy is dead? I don't think Stephen Hawking actually knows enough about philosophy to make any pronouncements about that um, based on my reading of, of his works. Um, but, you know, people have been saying that sort of thing for uh, generation after generation after generation, and it's not. You know, so so don't believe, you know, just some big name weighing in about, you know, philosophy as such. Um, philosophy is going to be around as long as human beings are around and, and, and we remain at a certain level of culture. <clears throat> it's going to take different forms. Um, a lot of it's going to be very boring and, you know, we, we can not read that stuff, right? Uh, a lot of it's going to be extremely useful and uh, then there's going to be a lot of stuff in, in the middle. Um, and uh, but if we actually want to be able to understand philosophy, we have to spend the time to to read them. Uh, we have to we have to work through it. You know, you you don't get to weigh in about Plato if you haven't spent some time reading Plato and thinking about Plato, because that's sort of like um, telling people that you don't like lemon meringue pie when you've never actually even had a pie. Um, so you know. Um, 
So I'm a big I'm a big booster of spending time with the text. That said, I think that it's it, we can't just like throw texts at people and say go to it, buddy. We have to provide um, some help and some resources, and that's what I try to do in my 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 channel um, and in my classes. Okay, let me <clears throat> scroll back up. A lot of new questions. So there we go. Um, Katarina asks, should we take practical advice from Stoicism or from any philosophy? There are also different, even contradictory, so how do we act without being too stupid or stubborn? Well, um, they're not all that contradictory. Um, if you read through classical moral philosophy, you're not going to find a lot of people saying that lying is a good thing um, in general. Uh, you will find some saying that maybe you should lie in these circumstances, but not in these. Um, but there's a recognition that in general, truth is better than, than lying. And now then, how do we parse it out? Or, you know, um, should we work on ourselves and change ourselves or not? Um, I mean, Plato, Aristotle, the Stoics, Epicurus, they all say yes. Um, so they're, they're not so contradictory. Uh, it's not like they're contradictory in every single point. And, you know, Epictetus uh, sort of frames the Stoic life as a process of working through our, our contradictions. We're kind of a mess as human beings. Um, now, there's a, there's a good question. Well, how do, we, how do we know which one we should pick? And I would say um, it's something that you can experiment with. Right? I mean, if this is why we do Stoic Week. It was originally called Live as a Stoic. And the idea was, you know, you give people some really rudimentary stuff and some exercises and try to have them be mindful about what, what's going on in the day in terms of their reasoning processes, their emotions, their actions. You have them do some, you know, uh, you know, sum up of that later on and provide a community where they can they can, you know, talk with each other and see what happens afterwards. Um, a lot of people, I think, can try it out, and they're like, yeah, it didn't work for me. Um, and then it could be because they didn't actually really apply themselves or they didn't understand it, or it, could, it really didn't work for them, right? Um, other people try it out, and they're like, yeah, this, this is pretty good. I guess they're on to something. Let me study some more stuff. Now I'm going to read Marcus Aurelius, or I'm going to read Epictetus, right? And there's, there's kind of a, a back-and-forth process. Um, you can be eclectic in, in how you do this. Cicero was an eclectic, and he's a great philosopher. I'm an eclectic. You know, There's some things that I like in Stoicism. There's other things where I'm like, I think Aristotle had it more right, or I think you know, this is better, or that's better. Um, and one of the other things to keep in mind is you, you can't possibly read everybody. So you, know, you find a couple that seem initially plausible to you and then you know try them out see see what works see if it makes any sense to you um and that again to go back to that pragmatic question that's being pragmatic um you know uh you have to actually see whether there's there's anything to it through experiment um now let me scroll down um Oh, here's a really interesting one from uh, Chiang Cheng Wen. How would you consider Hegel's view of Stoicism in comparison with actual Stoic philosophy? So this is something I've written a bit about in the Half Hour Hegel blog, and I actually owe another entry on it. Um, some of you may know that um, one of the big projects I've been working on for about three and a half years and we're actually celebrating a big milestone about this tomorrow. Uh, we're having a, a online party. Um, is the Half Hour Hegel project, where I'm taking Hegel's uh, phenomenology of spirit and I'm going through it line by line, paragraph by paragraph, not not skipping anything. Uh, commenting on it, creating a, a digital video commentary that that people then can use for understanding the text. And you know, we've had. Like uh, like three or four million minutes of of, of those videos viewed, uh, so a lot of people have found them useful. Um, and there is actually a section in the phenomenology called you know stoicism, skepticism, and the unhappy consciousness. So my take on on Hegel and stoicism is he had a very prevalent nineteenth century view 
on um, both Stoicism and skepticism and Epicureanism, that these are Hellenistic philosophy and they're what happens after the Greek city-state goes into decline. And they don't really uh, engage in the kind of um, great thinking that Plato and Aristotle were doing. Um, and they're really more about the individual trying to figure out how they are going to adapt themselves to a really screwed up and, and more and more screwed up uh, moral universe that, that they were, were in. Um, so I think that, you know, so to, to begin with, that's not an accurate depiction of Stoicism. The other thing is Hegel does a bit of shoehorning, I would say, to make, uh, make things fit uh, the narrative that he, he wants to tell. But I love Hegel, but, but sometimes uh, he's, he's uh, uh, one-sided, to use <laughs> one of his own words, in, in doing that. Um, let's go on. Um, oh, interesting practical question uh, from uh, Artiz Ar Ar Artizic Ganus, um, who's, who's actually Alfonso, somebody who I, I know. What do you think Marcus Aurelius would say about a leader being obligated to lie on behalf of a government with the intention of being positive for the greater constituency? So like uh, if we get bad news, should the leader maintain an upbeat, cheerful party line about it or should he tell people how it is? Um, well, I think Marcus would say that you should tell people how it is. Um, this is a question. The issue of lying uh, or, or even holding back on part of the truth, this is a question that did come up among the ancient Stoics, not in terms of statecraft, but in terms of commerce. Um, Cicero talks about it in either book three or book four of On Duties, and there was a, um, uh, a disagreement between two of the great Stoic scholarchs about it. Diogenes uh, was more fast and loose with, with uh, deception, and I think it's Antiochus comes after him, uh, was much more strict about it. Um, so, you know, in general, it's going to be better to... to, to uh, tell people how things are because then they can actually prepare for them. Um, now, you know, that, that said, that doesn't mean that you would have to necessarily blurt it from the, the rooftops or something like that. Right. Um, so there's, there's ways in which you could, you could, you could do that. Um, oh, here's an interesting personal question from Al Kiyama. You, Gregory, are a professional philosopher, but are you in any manner active in politics? If not, then why not? Um, I would say that I am, if I had to like, you know, say one way or the other, I'd say I'm fairly inactive in politics. You know, I don't run for office. I, uh, I don't uh, do a lot of political posting. Um, and um, every once in a while, I've done some volunteer work here and there, but I don't, I don't do a lot of it. But much of that is because I, I, given the kind of workload that I have, I don't, I don't have a lot of time for that and also living a, a life with my, my family. Um, I, I do uh, find it very difficult to, to locate a, a home in contemporary American politics. Um, there's good reasons why uh, none of the political parties out there particularly appeal to me. I think it's, it's horrible uh, how the Democrats and Republicans uh, have become our only options and have engaged in all this you know, crazy gerrymandering and rigging the system so that um, it's almost impossible for, for third parties to break in. Um, I hate the fact that the media is pretty much uh, obsessed with, with um, those two parties and what's going on with them, and that we have this massive lobbying machine, uh, in, in large part not caring particularly about either party, unless they're like, you know, the NRA lobbying the Republicans or NARAL you know, lobbying the, the Democrats. Um, I hate that it's, it's, it's sort of the default for most people, and so I find it difficult to, to, to do that. 
I, I, um, I vote, you know, I, I uh, do pay close attention to local politics um, because that's where we have some sway. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a, I'm not particularly optimistic about our current system. Um, I, I do think a lot about geopolitics and sort of the larger picture, but I, I'm not a player at all in that. So, um, oh, an ordered whole. This is an interesting point. It looks like we're almost, we're at time, but I'm going to go over just a little bit. A lot of Stoics are readable. Does that reflect how far into concepts they go into? Um, so like the idea, I suppose, would be the more readable you are, the less deep you're going into concepts. Um, and I, I would say, you know, that's, there's a contingent relation between that. Sometimes you have thinkers who are very readable and they're also going very deep into things. That's kind of rare. Um, there's also popularizations that of course are only going, you know, very, very, uh, uh, you know, they're going very shallowly into things. And then we have some people who are very deep, but hard to, to understand like Hegel, you know, or Kant for that matter. And there are other people who are, um, you know, the opposite. Um, I think that there's, there's, there's a lot of philosophical depth to the Stoics, much more, I would say, I've realized now than, than I thought there was when I was a graduate student. Um, and, uh, um, you know, the readability thing, some of that depends on which translation you get to. I mean, some of the older translations are, are kind of tough for, for quite a few people. Um, you know, it's interesting. Donald Robertson was talking about this a while back. There's, you know, Stoicism provides a kind of interesting basis in part and also a great complement to CBT and REBT approaches, cognitive approaches in, in psychotherapy. And yet um, people don't usually pick up um, a, a psychotherapeutic work and just read it and read it and read it over and over again. But they do go back to reading Epictetus and they do go back to reading Marcus. Um, there's something there. There's, there's something more. There's a surplus there that draws people back that, that you're not getting just from a handbook um, uh, in, in REBT or, or CBT or something along those lines. Um, and I think it's great that it's readable because the more time people do spend reading it, the more they can get into the concepts because, you know, with philosophy, um, oftentimes you don't get everything the 20th read in. Um, so that's, that's kind of a, a good, good thing. So there's a lot of other questions. Um, I don't know that I'll get to all of them. Um, let me grab a few that that look like they would be easy to uh, respond to um, so here's here's one um pyrituo minen how does stoicism respond to things like non-essentialism towards human nature and do you think that difference on these grounds would be irrelevant to whether one should actually practice stoicism so um, if you want to say that there isn't a human nature, that's a position that one shouldn't take for granted any more than one says that there is a human nature, right? Um, so the mere fact that there are alternative points of view doesn't mean that stoicism then suddenly becomes wrong, you know, or is called into the balance, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, can you, could you practice stoicism without worrying about whether there is a, a human nature? Yeah, you probably could. Um, I think thinking that there is a common human nature is, is a uh, part of the conceptual apparatus. Um, the other thing that I'll say about this too is, you know, just to say that there is a human nature doesn't mean that that human nature is something simple. And I think a lot of people who want to attack the notion of human nature same thing that comes up in the free will stuff, you know, generally what they're going to call human nature or free will is not what the great thinkers have meant by it. And so you don't get any mileage out of just saying, well, this is wrong and we know it because of neuroscience or something like that. Right. Um, you know, you got to actually, whenever you're engaging a philosophical um, position, you got to engage it sort of at its, at its strongest points. Um, and I, I just don't see a lot of the, you know, non-essentialism discourses out there um, 
really doing that. So um, do, 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 let me scroll down. Um, do, do, do. Ah, so here's a, here's a question. Uh, and I think this has been one that this guy has asked before, if it's the same person I'm thinking about. Rauden Ibarra, will we get a quick course on Marcus Aurelius meditations before March 2018? Um, I would love to understand this text better. It's been my favorite for several years. Uh, I would love to be able to say yes. I am going to be working on, on, on a Marcus course. Um, uh, Donald Robertson actually has a Marcus course right now. Um, but I don't think he and I would be doing exactly the same thing. And you know, I do these very close readings and going, you know, into all the different concepts and stuff like that. Um, I think he's, he's much more about immediate practice practicability, although he's really doing some interesting stuff on the, you know, Marcus and his mindset and what's going on with the history. Um, right now, I'm, I, I, you know, I just took on these two courses at Marquette that I got hired to teach a, a week before they started. So that has um, substantially cut into my time. Um, but I, I'm hoping to get to it. I, I'm, I have a few other things lined up before that I want to finish this Aristotle Categories course and bring that out. I want to get a course on Cicero's stoic paradoxes out uh but but aurelius is uh, uh meditations it's definitely something i want to do um oh. so there's there's a, a few other ones um Let me see here. I'll take, uh, let me see if I get, there's something I can take this very quickly uh, or very quick to, to talk about. Um, okay, so Ao Kama has, has one that I can answer fairly easily and then sign off. What do you think are the best and most useful Stoic ideas about human finitude and death? Um, so interestingly, um, I was recently on Death uh, Hangout talking about this um, with, with those guys who do some really cool work. Um, and, uh, you know, what, is, what does Stoicism have to tell us about death? So death is not something that um, it makes sense for us to, to fear. Um, the idea is that, you know, in general, we shouldn't try to kill ourselves or leave the life. You know, there is, there is a Stoic position on suicide, but... Stoics also thought that most of the people who, who do commit suicide are doing so for the wrong reasons. Um, but, you know, we will all die. And so we have to think about our own death, and we also have to think about the death of others. Epictetus, for example, says something that strikes many people as very cold in saying, you know, um, when you kiss your wife or your child, remind yourself that they are, they are something mortal and, and that they, they can die. Um, and we can say, oh, that sucks. You know, why should I think those morbid thoughts? Well, by doing so, it frees us up for um, appreciating the present that we we can um, do something in, where we where we have some freedom and have some choice to do something. Um, the other thing that the Stoics also, you know, you see them doing is um, they're willing, even though they don't think that the the soul is going to survive in any meaningful way after death. They're willing uh, sometimes to, to you know, resist tyrants and um, to take a stand for, for justice or to engage in, you know, like Cato did, civil war, um, because they think it's the right thing to do and to, to take the chance of, of dying or even sometimes the certainty of dying as, as a result. Um, and so I think they, they, they see it as the opportunity to die for something. And it doesn't necessarily have to be quite so so um, dramatic as that. You know, if we think about how we devote our, our time while we're alive, how we, how we devote our life, um, we only have so much time. You know, we could die tomorrow. Um, or, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm 47, so I can maybe look forward to another 30 or 40 years. Um, the, you know, the, the bigger part is, is behind me. Um, and uh, 
you know, how do I want to use that that time? Um, we have to think in terms of, of priorities and whether it's worth it spending on uh, these other people. So uh, the Stoics would say yes, in general, um, doing our duties and things like that. So, so death becomes something that offers us an opportunity to, to, um, to think matters through. So I'm going to call this to a close. Um, and uh, we're already like about 10 minutes over time. Um, great questions. I enjoyed this. I'll be doing another one on Facebook Live uh, next week, I believe. Let me actually check my calendar. I believe it's on Wednesday, um, but I'm not quite sure. Yeah, it is on, on Wednesday. Uh, I'll be doing another one. Um, usually I, I don't publicize these in advance because they are pop-ups, but I'll, I'll let you guys in on, on the, the secret. So, Great chat, and I will see you uh, some other time.